Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, can you hear me? Can you see me? Let's uh, get some uh, feedback here. If everything is working on my end, it seems that everything is loud and clear. Fantastic. So how is everybody today? Uh, hopefully we're not going to have any technical issues. Uh, so uh, to begin some housekeeping, first of all, welcome everyone to the first official episode because the previous one was more of a pilot and a, uh, a way to, to check out the technical details. Now, I will be watching the chat over here. If you do have questions uh, or if you want to start uh, yelling at me, type in capital letters. If there's a question, please type question with capital letters and uh, then ask your question. I'm going to try and, and keep track of everything that's going on. And uh, what else? Make sure my audio levels are good there. Um, I've got my camera there and I have my Mac over here and my PC over here. Good. <clears throat> so if anything goes wrong, because we may be expecting um, a minor thunderstorm here, they, they do happen these days, and uh, it's very hot, and we may have some thunder. Now, everything I'm using is connected to a UPS. So my Mac, my um, uh, networking, my, my switches, my modem, cable modem, all that. So in theory, um, we won't have a problem. Now, in any case, if anything goes wrong, because unfortunately I am using two PCs, and a Mac, and I'm not very much worried about the Mac. I'm more worried about the PCs, and uh, I've had some minor glitches this morning. Uh, if anything happens, go ahead to Twitter, at NosemanGR, and uh, if I need to post a new link or something like that, or, you know, divert the conversation so that, uh, you know, I keep you uh, occupied while I'm trying to remedy the technical issues. Good. So let's see. First of all, question. How's your day? Oh, my day is fine. I had my uh, morning meeting and uh, now I'm uh, at your disposal to look at certain things. We're going to discuss splines today. And uh, you may be surprised how many more things about splines uh, we can do and how many other things we need to know about splines in order to get full control. And we're going to go as long as we can. And um, uh, I'll see if I run out of uh, content, I'm pretty sure we'll uh, find something to talk about. So let's see. Yes. So uh, let's go. Uh, uh, good. Hello. Hello. I'm hyped. Question. How's your day? Yep. That's it. Um, so housekeeping question. Is this going to be a recurring thing going to do like Rocket Lasso? Yes. Um, and uh, one thing is to try and talk about specific topics. Today it's splines, but splines have so many, um, I would say, connected elements. Uh, they have animation, they have uh, their own existence. What are splines? What do they create? We have modeling, we have all sorts of things, espresso and so forth. So there's quite a lot to talk about uh, splines. Any things that um, we don't cover or any questions uh, that uh, arise through these live sessions, um, then it's up to you to post specific uh, questions and I make tutorials. So this feeds the rest of my uh, offline tutorial making quick tips and stuff like that. In a very, um, in, in the future, I'm trying to run these every two weeks. That doesn't mean that I won't try to do them more often. And uh, one of the next ones we're going to do is going to be about UVs. That's going to be an exciting one uh, because uh, I'm going to try and show um, from the very fundamentals of UVs, uh, limitations of the UV technology, not um, specifically Cinema 4Ds, but generally UVs do have some limitations. They work within the boundaries of the technology and so forth. So um, UVs uh, would be something else. And the other thing, I want to start having guests. And uh, two of the guests I'm going to have over the next few months, one of them is um, Chris Pretty. Uh, 510 Giant, and he's a master of getting the CAD, making it look 
uh, beautiful and rendering in uh, octane or redshift, but he's uh, very good at dealing with um, really difficult CAD files. The other person I'm going to talk to is my very good friend Orestes Cosantinides. He used to work for uh, Maxon and he was a part of uh, the design team uh, that uh, developed and designed uh, the fields technology. Now, uh, he is one of the most knowledgeable people I know in Cinema 4D, but above all, he's an excellent uh, rigger and he's a character animator as well. So, um, with all my guests, besides the chit chat we're going to have and uh, the banter and all that, uh, they are going to share their screens and they are going to show things uh, live. So, um, the other thing is uh, feedback. So, you know where my uh, communication lies on Twitter mostly. Uh, ask questions. Uh, be funny, be sarcastic, expect sarcasm back. And uh, let's, uh, if you have any questions, um, if you have any scene files you want to share and all that, uh, just um, uh, DM me or something like that. Uh, but try and simplify your scenes before. So we are six minutes in the stream. Let me see if we have any uh, quantum, <laughs> quantum spline theory. Yeah. So let's go. How do you affect clones sequentially one after the other when they're in the same place? Yeah, uh, that is an interesting question. It's not that um, hard. Um, you would uh, use a uh, either an effect, a step effect or a step field. And that's exactly what that does. Um, if you have these kind of specific questions, because MoGraph uh, is a very good subject to cover. So let's see. Um, you should be worried about your PC. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to continue that because I agree with you. Um, Patrick loves me. I love you too, Patrick. I love you all. There's a lot of love here. Um, have we saved? Yes. So the, the stream, uh, first of all, uh, you can go back and see it on the spot. I think it's called uh, DVR mode. So you're allowed to come at the stream at any time and watch it either the real time or uh, rewind and watch it uh, previously if you miss something. And the stream, once it's finished, it takes a couple of hours to get the standard definition version. I think, I think it's a 360p version, uh, so you can watch it. But if you wait for a few hours, then it actually converts the full uh, 1080p. And um, yeah, the streams are going to stay on my YouTube channel to watch uh, anytime. And I'm, I'm trying to put some time stamps um, so that you can navigate a bit easier. So uh, UVs, um, do, 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 good. Yeah. Excellent. So we have uh, 34 guests uh, now. And uh, let's uh, switch to my uh, Mac screen. We may talk, talk about knots as well. It's a question... I uh, had yesterday. I'm going to switch. Um, first of all, um, one little reply. I switched to my PC. Please let me know if you can still hear me. Um, if you don't reply in like 15 seconds, that means you cannot hear me. Uh, let's see. A reply. Can you hear me? I just want to make sure that everything is working. Um, do, do, do. And the the chat still hasn't good you can hear me and you can see the pc screen uh, i would guess you can see the knot being tied good and uh, now i'm going to switch to my mag screen and uh, hopefully you can uh, still hear me and see something like that i'm going to show you some interesting little tricks so good excellent so we are going to begin from the very very basics and that is what exactly is a spline? Now, we all think we know what a spline is, but uh, I realized years later that there are a few um, nuances uh, that we don't know. So I've opened a new um, document here. And uh, let's first look at something that's not very obvious. And uh, let's just create a, a spline, all right? And uh, immediately when you create a spline, you're in point mode. So uh, make sure you go to model mode. Now, this is an editable spline, right? There's no doubt about this. And when it comes to editable objects, let's make a cube and make it editable. Editable objects, point objects, mesh objects, they don't have a tick mark, right? They don't have a tick mark over here. But splines do. Although this is an editable spline, we can edit the points. It still has a tick mark. And that is because, by definition, a spline is a generator, and uh, specifically, it's a line generator. 
And uh, of course, you can ask me, what is this jibber jabber? What, what is this, you know, line stuff you're talking about? Well, the segments uh, we create by changing the intermediate points and, and all that, those are the lines, the little straight line segments. Because what we see here, especially if we go to the point mode and see the gradient from white to blue, first of all, white to blue means that this is the direction, the flow of the spline. This is the first point, goes all the way here, and this is the last point. And the gradient is what um, uh, sort of shows us which direction the spline goes. Now, just uh, to know what that means is that let's uh, take a little uh, sphere, uh, make it small, and put an align to spline to it and drag the spline here. You will see that the zero position is at the beginning of the spline, the white part, and the 100%, you see the white part of the spline, it gradiates to blue. Uh, that is the end. So blue is the end. So this is the uh, how the spline flows. Excellent. So let's continue with that whole mystery about uh, the spline being a generator. Now, if I go to uh, the proper model mode, and let's uh, make an extrusion, right? I'm going to make an extrude object, and I'm going to go here and put it on hidden lines. And we can see all the... Um, um, the segmentation uh, that's created. And uh, usually we just accept it as it is, maybe change some of these intermediate points and the adapt uh, adaptiveness and all that. But essentially, each one of these is a straight line. If we go close, you will see it's a straight line. And if I turn this off, um, you will be able... Uh, oh yeah, it was uh, extruding that way. So let me zoom in. You can actually see these segments. This is a straight segment. This is another straight segment. And they happen to coincide uh, with uh, the segmentation. So a spline is a line generator that uses two sets of parameters, the type and the intermediate points, in order to figure out how it's going to create these line segments. And uh, for anyone that doesn't know, let's quickly go and um, check out the different modes and what they mean. So Bezier is a typical Bezier. We have an illustrator and uh, whatnot. And you select a point, you have your control vertices and you move them around. Now, a couple of things about the control vertices, uh, some uh, shortcuts like the shift breaks the, uh, the tangent and um, it has, uh, you know, it allows you to do um, sort of uh, sharp edges. If for any reason you do this and you want to recover that um, sort of continuous uh, nature, you just select the point, you right click and you do a soft interpolation uh, or equal tangent direction, all right? And uh, there you go. So they're stuck again. And um, that is a, as simple as it, as it goes. Now, I don't know if you know that if you double click on a point, it will give you um, all the options depending on what point it is. And here it gives you the actual XYZ of the point, the position of that. Um, uh, point and the control vertices uh, left tangent XYZ and right tangent XYZ and you can use these to fine-tune your splines again uh, that's uh, quite simple and of course we can use the move tool and press uh, command or control and add a point or go to the end press command or control to extend it uh, command or control extends the end regardless where I put the mouse and shift command or control on the PC extends the beginning so you can go and extend your spline as much as you want. And there are a few other things. Let's go back to these modes. Now, linear is just connecting these with the linear segments. And uh, cubic is a mode where the spline itself goes through the points. And uh, that is, it does make a difference if you're using this spline to animate things and you want the objects you're animating on the spline to go through very specific points, you will use something like a cubic or an akima. Cubic and akima are similar. They have different uh, interpolations, but they both go through the points. Whereas a B spline doesn't. Only by coincidence, if two points are in the straight line, it will go through. By definition, it doesn't. So depending on what you're trying to do, you're going to use the appropriate type. So uh, let's uh, continue. Let's talk. Let's go back to the uh, Bezier because it's uh, something we, we are more um, used to because of Adobe Illustrator. Now, the intermediate points, intermediate points, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of the different modes. None means none. So every point Regardless of what the spline is by itself, it will create these straight 
segments. Now, natural means that we're going to have this number between two points. So let's take a look at this. Let's go on the other side. We have one point here and one point here. And in between, we have one segment. That is natural. Between this point and uh, the other point over... Where are the other points? There you go. One and one here. We have another in between. And between this one and this one, we have one point. So natural, it subdivides between two uh, points uh, the the line so that we have this number of segments between. So two will create two between each point and so forth. The uniform tries to create an overall um, uniform breakdown. Although it's trying to put uh, segmentation close to this number between two points, it tries to do that. It also tries to keep each segment straight. And the, the big difference, um, I'm going to show you right after this, the difference in animation uh, you achieve using either uniform or natural, and it has to do with timing. So the last, uh, the, well, the penultimate one is adaptive. And the adaptive only subdivides where the spline is curved and uh, using this threshold uh, angle so that uh, the smaller it becomes, the more subdivisions we have. And zero is the maximum subdivision we can have using the uh, adaptive. And uh, this is good for when you want the program to optimize your polygon generation as much as possible. Excellent. Now, the final one, which for me is my favorite for modeling, the subdivided. The subdivided is a combination. Um, and uh, basically, it takes any curved elements, anywhere it finds a, a turn, a curve on the spline, it uses the angle, and it, wherever it finds straight segments, it uses the maximum length. And the best way to illustrate that is with typefaces. And uh, because one of the problems when we are using typefaces, um, and especially if we want to do deformations, is that because we have... Um, this as default, you can see the spline text, which is uh, again a, a, a proper spline. It only gets the points from the font and so forth. It uses by default the adapter. And the problem is that it doesn't create enough subdivisions where you have the straight segments. And most fonts have a lot of uh, straight segments. So the, if you use anything, um, if you use natural, um, you could. The problem is that between two points, let's say the point here on the X and this point, because the distance is larger and you have this number between segments, look at the difference here. This little segment has all these small ones and this one has all these large ones because it tries to keep the number between the points the same. Of course, you would say, yeah, I'm going to go to uniform. Not really, because the uniform, trying to keep the length of these, is going to destroy your corners. So the viable solution for keeping the actual shape of your text and providing the optimum subdivision is actually the subdivided, because now you can control all the round elements, like the T here or the E over here, using this, this number, the angle. And you can change the maximum length on the straight segments using uh, this angle. And I hope I didn't freeze it because, oh, please don't do this to me. Just give me a second. Uh, it will recover. Um, it will recover. It will recover. Well, what I can do, though, until it recovers, is switch to my PC. So... Uh, here we have the PC, and I'm trying to uh, sort of uh, let me... I think I may need to restart it on the Mac, but anyway, let's continue here and see what else we have to say. I'm going to open a new scene, and I'm going to create um, my uh, spline. Let's create my text spline again, and let's get my extrude again, and let's do exactly what we did previously while uh, the Mac is trying to recover, because I think I set the maximum s uh, length to something too small. So things do happen. I'm going to look at my questions for a second and see if there's anything um, of interest. And I really do hope that my, yeah, my Mac has uh, clogged a bit. So allow me to, in the meantime, I'm trying it's a combination of technology. I'm using a mouse sharing um, application, which may or may not have, uh, yeah, 
<laughs> I can't see my mouse. Oh, there you go. I can see my mouse now. Let me just, um, uh, you can see the PC, but I'm doing things on my Mac. I'm forcing the Cinema 4D to shut down and I'm firing up again and I'm back on my PC. So I'm very sorry. This is what happens in live shows. So we are talking about the uh, subdivided mode and uh, it's the ideal mode to um, separately control the subdivisions on uh, the curves and the subdivisions on the straight segments. Now, uh, since we're on the subject of um, uh, deformations, uh, there's uh, two more places where we need to um, deform uh, the the text well, sorry where we need to subdivide the text in order f to make it good for heavy deformations one is down these straight lines and that is um, uh, the extrudes um, responsibility there you go and uh, the last one is the caps because uh, these are engons and of course they're going to collapse if I add some sort of bend deformer and all that and uh, just in case um, you want to see i'm looking at the text uh, at the chat just in case i miss something let's go and uh, do something like this let me uh, rotate it this way and uh, that way just to get some weird um, deformation you can see here and i'm going to deform it quite uh, rapidly here i want to create some sort of odd deformation and go to my bend deformer and extend this because these are um, engons you do get this is where we have a problem because the engon is trying to bend where the engon lines are and uh, let's go good all shading lines yeah it won't show them to me unfortunately for some reason but we are getting problems with the engons and we're getting artifacts over here maybe you can see the shading anyhow to make a long story short, there you go. This is a very obvious artifact. The long story short is you go to the caps and uh, my favorite is to go and set this as a regular grid. Make sure you untwirl this and you say quad dominant. And uh, there's a rule of thumb where you use the same maximum length of your sides. Uh, and that's just a rule of thumb, right? Don't, uh, don't do this, uh, don't, always follow this you can make them smaller to get a better uh, subdivision but this way now because we have all these little uh, quads the deformation itself is going to be spectacular without any um, artifacts and so forth what you see here are fong artifacts these are fong artifacts and i guess that i can eliminate them if i make my uh, length here three and there you go or change my fong angle to something like uh, let's say 24 and we won't have those problems anymore Anyhow, so let me switch uh, back to my Mac after I've, uh, let me go first, uh, Mac. So I'm switching to my Mac and uh, let me go to the questions and see um, what we have here. So I try to step effector, but it affects them in different amounts. I want them. Yeah. So post that question with a sample file, just to use a sample file and um, with, with cubes. Uh, so I can uh, prepare uh, some sort of reply or a video or something like that. Good. Next question. Um, Jacob uh, Zuskin. Uh, sorry for my pronunciation. Is there a way to procedurally resample and subdivide spline? Oh, yes, like the option next particles, spline measure. Yes, we are going to talk about that in a second. Let me read the other questions. Uh, uh, change <coughs> the gradient of the spline, kind of like a material uh, gradient. Uh, no, but um, renderers like uh, Redshift allow you to render splines with all sorts of uh, interesting tricks. Um, let's see. Okay. So let's do the animation thing I told you to show you the difference uh, between uh, the, the, the uh, intermediate points and how that affects animation. And then we're going to go to the resampling, which is one of the things I was planning to show anyway. So let me go and find, I already have a file, but no, I'm going to create it from scratch. Don't worry. Let's go to the top view and let's create a, a spline. I'm going to create a Bezier spline. These two points are close to each other and one is going to go far away. Good. So we have this um, discrepancy of where the points lie. These these two are very close to each other and this one is very far away, which means that 
Um, if I use uh, different modes, we can have different speeds for any object that uses this spline for animation. So let's make this 20 and let's go and do the um, align to spline and let's drag the spline here. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to set this to uh, 30. Uh, so we have three points, don't we? Yes. One, two and three. So I'm going to do the following thing. I'm going to set... Uh, this the position zero at frame zero uh, 45 I'm going to set it to 50 percent and 90 I'm going to set it to 100 percent and uh, you will see that we have this weird acceleration going on and I'm going to create because I want to see the segments I'm going to create an extrude and use a spline we can do that uh, and this is the easiest way to see the, the spline segmentation here, all right? And what you're seeing is that we have denser subdivision, uh, subdivisions on this part where the two points are and a much larger distance here. And you can see that the speed of the sphere um, is... Um, it has a relationship with how many of these point, uh, points we have, how many segments we have. And I think that if I take that point and rotate it here it's going to go much faster then it's going to slow down quite significantly so you can see the speed is um, relative to the segmentation when we have less segments it travels faster when we have more segments it goes slower because it's trying to go through the segments at the same time frame now watch this if I take the spline and say uniform you will see now that the uh, speed of this sphere is pretty much the same. Now, there's one more thing I need to do, which I forgot to do. You need to go to your timeline. There's my timeline. Timeline F curve, and make sure that we don't have um, ease in and ease out. So now this is properly um, the 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 same speed. It's going at the same velocity. So again, if I go here and go to adaptive, you will see that it goes slow, then fast, and then slow again. Although our actual keyframing is linear. If I change this to uniform, now I have the co a constant speed over the whole spline. But if I go and set this to natural, what I'm going to have is a constant speed between the first two points and then another constant speed between the rest. So when you want to control the, um, the speed when you're using an animation um, with the spline, so using the spline as an animation guide, by knowing how these line segments are created at what distances and in what frequency, you can pretty much get a good gauge on uh, your the animation of the object that uh, what what it's following and uh, just to make this even more obvious what's going on here i'm going to make uh, these little uh, poles right these are poles and uh, i'm going to use um, a, a cloner in object mode and i'm just going to throw my spline in here and i'm going to set this to vertex so i get one at each point and what you will see is that at the 45 at 50 percent of our total animation <clears throat> it reaches the middle of the animation not the object itself so you can see that the timing can be very precise knowing that you have three points on the spline you have uh, the one two and three and because we are using natural and we are subdividing between each of these points in an equal amount of lines. I'm not going to count them now, take my word for it. We can actually control the animation of the sphere so that it goes at equal uh, speed, let's say, equal time, not speed, equal time between the points. So from frame 0 to frame 45, which is the 50th percentile of our animation, it goes to the middle point, which happens to be this, and the rest over here. And knowing this allows you to strategically place uh, different points and um, changing the way this um, animation evolves so that you know precisely which, uh, at which point of the spline your animated object is going to be at any given moment. If you want it to be, again, uh, you want the speed to be constant, you use uniform. If you want it to be controlled, uh, 
that the speed is equal between every two points, you put it natural, and you can play around with these um, in any manner you wish. If you want uh, this to go uh, faster in the straights and uh, slower in the curves, you will do something like this. So it will go slower in the curves and faster in the straights. So you can use any of these modes knowing exactly what it produces. So let's see if we have any other questions, uh, for example. All right. <clears throat> if we don't have any questions about uh, this particular thing, I'm going to go into the resampling thing because it is one of uh, my favorite uh, workflows to use most spline to resample. So the, the procedural way, um, with the, whatever limitations it may or may not have, is using the most spline. So... If you go here and uh, bring up a most spline, the most spline amongst other modes in the modes here in the object tab has a spline mode. And in the spline mode, you can drop in the spline tab any of the, um, any spline and you can change the, the way it's uh, sampled. So let's take um, another Bezier and do the same so, thing I did before and excellent. So there it is and go to the most spline, drag the spline in the source. And uh, now, because I want to see what kind of segmentation it creates, I'm gonna add a an extrusion. I'm gonna put it on the Y so I can see it right up and uh, go to hit lines. So by definition, it's a vertex. So it will create whatever this is uh, creating. But if you go to the most spline and change this mode to something like count, um, how many? So here we have a hundred subdivisions. The way these subdivisions are created is relevant to what the spline is. So if I say uniform, now we have a hundred uniform points. Uh, but how these uniform points are going to be placed is uh, very much based on how the spline is interpolated anyway. So we get the best of both worlds. And um, you can choose to have only 10 segments. So now there you go. We have only 10 segments. And uh, what else can you do? You can do even, which is, I think, a distance. Um, uh, let's see. No, that's not even. It's step. Step gives you a distance. So now each segment is about 10 centimeters. So again, you can use this to control your splines in any way you want. So uh, this is the way I prefer to do my um, spline segmentation. And um, amongst other things today, I'm going to show you uh, a technique uh, that, although it includes splines and a lot of this uh, jibber jabber here, as uh, um, who was that? Mr. T. Um, uh, I, they used to call me Mr. T uh, a long time ago, although uh, I didn't have the mohawk. Um, I did have hair though. That's a different story. Because my name is, my short name is Thanasis. It starts with a T, so Mr. T. Anyway, jibber jabber. Uh, maybe none of you, maybe that you're all too young to remember what I'm talking about. Uh, anyhow, um, just Google Mr. T. So, uh, the most blind to, to get back to the original question, uh, most blind is the way you would use to resample a spline. Now, there's one little trick um, up uh, the most blind sleeve. And that is that if you don't want to use the most blind itself for whatever reason, you can actually go to the object tab and it has this fantastic destination spline. And what this destination spline is, is the following. Let's get this spline. Let's make a copy and let's go and delete all the points of that spline. There you go. So this is an empty spline now, right? There it is, an empty spline. There's nothing in this spline. Let's call this dest for destination if you take tell the most spline to feed the whatever data it's creating with whatever means spline mode turtle mode and all that to an actual spline look at this boom there it is the upside of this is that for as far as cinema 4d is concerned this destination spline is indistinguishable from any other spline although it's driven by a most spline. So if uh, there's a case where the most spline itself will not work in some sort of context, 
or there's excessive data because there's a lot of stuff that the most blind carries with it. Um, it can um, get effectors, it can it can uh, use forces and all that. And maybe the only thing you need to do is the uh, resampling and nothing else. Uh, this is the way to do it. You tell the most blind to drive this destination, spline. So that way uh, you have an extra level of control and uh, you can use this as an ordinary spli spline that actually gets its data from the most blind, including growing and all sorts of uh, interesting stuff because uh, yeah growing a spline is always interesting good so let me look at my little um let me show my face and say hi to everyone that's uh, here hello everyone anyone that's uh, new to the stream um let's see a question now could you also use a matrix using the spline as an object uh, then an effector to hide certain matrix points in that way sort of having procedural subdivision on splines using fields I'm trying to understand that uh, could you also use a matrix using a spline as an object okay then an effector to hide certain matrix points um, could you I mean you can use the the tracer object so let's go back to the Mac screen this time I'm not going to forget my camera on and everyone will be screaming like what happened the other day I was showing things on my computer and everyone could see my beautiful face I know that you want to see my face but sometimes you just need to see my computer good and uh, you can always screen grab um, my, my face and put it next to your monitors and look at me whenever you want good <clears throat> Uh, let's uh, go to that uh, yeah uh, segue let's create a matrix object so let me create a new document let's create a matrix object and uh, let's make it uh, linear and let's um, add a few more of these now uh, if we take this matrix and use it uh, using another of my uh, favorite uh, tools my favorite spline tools which is the tracer one of the modes that the tracer has um, which is not the default is connect all elements and basically this will create a spline through all the elements of uh, whatever I'm doing here so you can see that uh, if I start yeah there you go so we can create something now as far as I know I'm not absolutely sure but I think that the most spline object uses uh, a lot of the the technology that the matrix has uh, let's not forget that both the um, uh, most spline and the matrix are MoGraph objects so <clears throat> you can see that you can pretty much do that using a tracer and a matrix now let's go to the matrix and hide some points and and see how that um, works for us so select the matrix let's go and add a plane effector and let's uh, set the plane effector not points but to visibility and let's go here and add a um, let's say a linear field and see what happens and you can see that that doesn't work because and the reason it doesn't work the fact that we hide matrices does not oh there you go so that is yeah I was wrong about that I was under the impression that hiding a matrix doesn't eliminate it it just ch changes its visibility but alas happily I was wrong but there's a, a bit of an update thing maybe I don't know why but uh, that's uh, what's happening now and I don't really mind sometimes an extra update here or there may make it work or not huh. we we do have certain issues with this particular uh, way it works so there is an update problem so in this particular case uh, you can probably use another method directly with the most blind and so forth but anyhow you can see that the the technique is pretty much similar again hmm why would this be the case uh, anyway I'm not even gonna ponder on this maybe I look at it ask me on Twitter and maybe I can I can uh, do that so the this is um, what if it was a sphere field a spherical field well it's gonna try a spherical field let's make this into a spherical field and see what happens well I guess that when it goes in here and show these little buggers um, again we're gonna have that update problem but yeah it, it works as it would I'm pretty sure you can find other methods and don't forget if you check out my other videos on my YouTube channel I do have several um, open source Python uh, plugins uh, you can check out the code and all that that deal with splines so you can have a lot of fun so, all right, let's invert it and see what happens. 
boop. And let's turn this off and on. Yes, it doesn't create two segments. It just connects the last two visible segments we have. There you go. <clears throat> Stuff with spline dynamics. I'm going to leave that for the end. There's something about spline dynamics uh, because they don't have intersections, self-intersections. So you can't get two splines to dynamically interact with each other, although hair does interact, I tend to avoid using them in that context unless um, uh, um, I want to do some couple of things that are hanging and they don't interact with each other. And having said that, I do prefer to use for my simulations uh, connectors, uh, a series of connectors. And uh, today I'm going to show you um, an interesting plugin called HoRope. Now, this was abandoned, its development was abandoned a few years ago, but if you download the, the um, it's like a script, but it's a, a plugin. Um, I'm going to show you how it works, and that's how I did my knot earlier. If you download it, I'm going to tell you what you need to do to make it work, uh, which is um, uh, fairly simple. You just open it in a text editor, and you exchange the, uh, you find the word X range, and uh, change it to range, you remove the X. I'm gonna show you how to do that so you can download the plugin and use it in any version above 19 because uh, above 19 or 20, 21, something like that, when we got Python 3 as our Python, certain things about Python 3 changed the way certain plugins uh, work. Sim but usually it's print statements needs parentheses and uh, X range doesn't, it's not used anymore. It was uh, deprecated and uh, now it's just range. It's the four next loops. Anyway, so, um, I may even post something on, on Twitter about that. Please remind me, I do tend to forget. Now, I'm um, going to show my face again. So, uh, nice smile. Um, I'm looking at my notes. Uh, I'm checking the questions for a second. So, let's see. Any way to place splines on surface procedurally when surface is uh, displacing? Uh, I need to look... Um, look at that um, shrink wrap maybe or something like that I don't want to do any tests now because I can uh, I don't want to break stuff um, let's see projecting splines based on camera view yes um, um, I will show that very quickly so um, yeah discord slack channel I know that I'll tell you what the problem is right I'm going to be totally honest with you um, this is a, a side project I'm uh, not at least currently uh, profiting on, right? Um, it's 100% um, community, uh, uh, facing the community. I'm doing this because uh, it, it's sort of paying back from the years of the fantastic uh, uh, trainers like um, Dr. Sassy, Matthew O'Neill, uh, Tim Clapham, uh, Ben Watts. All these, you know, all these people that have created these fantastic tutorials and, uh, you know, even uh, Nick Campbell from Grayscale Gorilla and uh, Chris Schmidt and all that, uh, they've given us so much training. And this is just my way to say thank you and just to, you know, offer a learning path and entertainment to uh, anyone that's interested. Um, if I were to start creating Discord channels which need maintenance and all that, uh, that will require a significant amount of uh, work from my part. I can barely handle, uh, you know, my day job uh, consulting for Maxon and working with the training and learning team and my own videos. You know, I have to work in my weekends and late at night and, and all that. So uh, we will see. We will see. As I said in the previous stream, um, I'm thinking of a uh, monetization path where, um, you know, you... you watch a few adverts and, um, you know, YouTube centering money, pretty much. The the viewership I have currently don't make any sense. I am ready to monetize, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to burden you with ads uh, to make uh, 60 cents a month, right? It doesn't make any sense. If this becomes a, a you know, a viable sort of uh, side business or something like that, that makes some sort of sense, I will start putting more effort into it. Uh, so currently it's um, Twitter basically uh, over here. Um, follow me on Instagram because I don't post. That's that's exactly why you need to follow me on Instagram because I promise not to post. I have one post and I'm going to keep it that way. I don't even know how it works, but that's another story, right? I'm going to edit this, edit this out of the the video. So uh, yeah, the my YouTube channel 
the videos I make, the live streams, uh, anything I can, any help I can provide on uh, the, um, the social media channels like Twitter, uh, mostly, uh, mostly, sorry, mainly, um, uh, Twitter mainly, and uh, for, th for the time being, that's as much as I can handle. I'm old, right? My brain is of, uh, yeah, the previous century. I was born before uh, humans went to the moon, by the way. Just in case you didn't know, it's my first memory on TV. I was born in 1966, and in 1969, um, I remember watching that uh, in, the, in London with my parents uh, on a black and white TV. Anyhow, let's get back to the Mac screen. See, I'm not forgetting this time. Where are you physically? Uh, in my basement. <laughs> ha! I'm in um, the outskirts of um, uh, Toronto. It's called Oakville. Uh, and it's very, very expensive. That's why we don't own a house. So, uh, greetings from Belgium. Yes. So, where are we here? Do, 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 do. Uh, okay. What was I saying? See, th this is what happens to me. Now I have to recuperate. Uh, old enough to remember oscilloscopes and all that goofy stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, you, we were used to write, at school, we used to write on uh, stone tablets, right? That's how old I am. Good. <clears throat> So I was going to show, I was going to show, I was going to show, I'm going through my list here. Um, we showed that. Okay, a couple of easy generators we can use with splines just to demystify a few things. And these are the spline mask and the connect object. And uh, I'm going to show it for you for a good reason. So one circle and then let's get a, let's get a square, a rectangle. Let's move to the side and rotate it. Loop. And uh, you say, take this and let's subtract, subtract this and it says this is the important part axes x y along z you need to make sure uh, that the splines when you project one spline over the other in the z direction that it hits the other one so that's why i can pull this this way and it still creates a spline because the projection is towards the z axis okay now this is this is an interesting spline if you create a cap it's going to be the but uh, overall, you can make all sorts of interesting shapes this way. So let's go back and um, set this to whatever I had it on the Z zero. Now for subtracting, this is um, uh, quite good. And um, if you want to add splines, and then you can actually use the connect. If you go and find uh, the videos about the sensors, um, the, the, it was, I think, the 3D ro motion show before uh, COVID. And uh, I think in 2019, I'm doing a breakdown using the connect object and so forth. So we can take this, we can take another spline, let's take an n-sided, move it here, put both of these under a connect object, which I always tell people, don't forget to unweld uh, that should be the default. And uh, now we have a single spline. What you see here is a single spline. And maybe I want to go and from this single spline, I want to subtract something else. Uh, let's say this. Now I hope it doesn't break down because sometimes it does odd things. I'm going to get another spline mask and say from this spline, please uh, subtract that one. So A subtract B. And there you go. So you can use a combination of the connect object to sort of add splines together and the spline mask. Now you can always do unions here and so forth, but for some reason I find the connect object uh, more to my liking. But as usual, <laughs> uh, Sebastian, are we doing Pac-Man? Actually, that's uh, one of my questions for the certification. So anyone that just watched this will know how to answer one of the questions. Good. And uh, there you go. You can do these procedural animations and so forth. Now, you will see that sometimes we get these oddities uh, because uh, it's very difficult for Cinema 4D to, to say, how am I going to subtract a zero height sp uh, spline from another one? Just you be mindful because it may seem for humans quite self-explanatory, like, oh, don't do it. But um, with algorithms, that's not the case, right? This is just one of a thousand different ways we can put the same splines together and uh, uh, make Cinema 4D uh, confused. But uh, if you're mindful enough, you can create some amazing shapes using a combination of the spline mask and the connect object and uh, make your you know, subsequent modeling um, an extremely easy thing, right? There you go. 
fantastic logos and stuff. So let's get rid of that. Let's see if we have any questions. Can you show some tips for doing spline intersection like lasers? Well, uh, that will be more of a lighting thing itself. I don't think... Um, if you're doing lasers, it is my understanding, if you, if you want them to be physical objects, use uh, cylinders or, or uh, capsules, very thin and long capsules, and put some sort of Fresnel shader on them. Or... Another thing you can do is use lights. And uh, as far as uh, lights are concerned, you can use a, a parallel spot. That will be the ideal thing. And you just make it visible. And uh, you have this. And you can turn off the fall off or extend this and do all sorts of uh, fancy stuff. And if you make this thin enough and uh, let's say bright enough, you have laser. Okay, so your answer has been... Uh, you have given me an answer. So this is what I would do if I'm going to do lasers. I would do a very thin parallel spot with visibility and uh, whatnot. So, <clears throat> oh, there you go. Chris Schmidt, new plugin called Ricochet. Yes, um, uh, because I'm a fan of splines overall, I do advise you to go check out uh, Chris's uh, plugin, Ricochet. Um, it's called Ricochet because it deals predominantly with bouncing splines, creating splines by bouncing, let's say, rays off uh, geometry. And that is uh, fantastic because uh, you can create uh, splines inside an object. It bounces around as many times as you want. You can create um, amazing effects. Uh, in, it's my understanding that if you're doing motion graphics, if you're doing things that have a lot of thin structures or internal structures you like, organic stuff and all that, I would say that uh, Ricochet is more uh, than a worthy uh, investment, all right? It will it will uh, pay off uh, very, very soon because it is a paid plugin. I would say check out the videos and just go and buy it. Okay, so... Um, what is two rail in the modifiers? All right, we're going to talk about rails. Um, let me see if I have another question. Or different methods, the redshift, how we can take that spotlight, shine through glass and all that. Um, that is a question uh, for, throw it to me on, on Twitter. Uh, and when you're asking questions about how to create X and Y effect, it will be good if you post an image of what exactly you're trying to do. Because... Um, there may be many different ways that achieve slightly different results, and there may be a way of doing certain things better than other ways. So, yeah, let me know on Twitter for lights and stuff like that, because that will be an interesting thing. We can do with lights uh, all sorts of things, make planets and, oh, sorry, stars and, and suns and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, up here there was... Um, do, 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 do. Let's see how set up. It's the beginning. Are we doing Pac-Man? Yes, Basti, we are doing Pac-Man. All right, rails. Now let me see my list where we showed animating and rail splines. Okay, let's check check out what rail splines are. What what is what is the essence of rail splines? So, one of the things that a spline doesn't have uh in within its uh, data structure so if i take uh let's take a helix but there's something about the helix which i sort of like and i'm going to make this uh, 50 and 100 right so i have this nice uh, little helix here now intuitively as humans we we see this and let me go and put a color automatic and let's put a nice little greenish bluish whatever teal color here all right now if i make this editable and go to each one of the, the points here. Um, it appears that they have some sort of rotation, right? Now, if I rotate a Bezier spline, I do rotate the, the control vertices, but the, the, the rotation does not get recorded. So I can do this, and after I release, if you look at down here at the rotations, I'm going to rotate this point, release, and it's back to zero. That is because, by definition... A point, a spline, does not record rotational information. There's nothing about rotation. The only information a point has, if I double-click on it, is if it's a Bezier uh, point, it has the actual X, Y, Z and the two tangents. If it's a, uh, let's say, B spline or something like that, let's get a B spline, then the B spline doesn't have any tangents. So there is no rotational information associated with uh, splines. Okay, now... 
it has too many points and too many points stress me out. So let me go and uh, frame default. Let's create a nice little Bezier here and uh, go to over there. Now, how do I control rotation when a spline is involved? Now, there are a few indirect ways to do that, uh, as you may already know. If I take an inside, make it into a triangle, make it smaller to make it more visible and get a sweep and sweep this over here. Usually it sweeps over the tangent, uh, the tangential direction of the, the spine. And uh, for anyone that uh, doesn't know, a tangent is imagine a straight line that's pointing to the, the point in front of the point we are. So if we're here, it's pointing that way, that way, that way. So it's always pointing in a line that's tangential to that particular curve. And this is what the sweep does by definition. It sweeps the z-axis of our little triangle here over that tangent. Now, what if I want to spin this around, right? Because that will be cool. I need to go to the sweep and go to the details and go to the rotation and start spinning things around. But this will spin based on the totality of the spline from the beginning, which is here zero rotation, all the way to the end, which now has a maximum of 180, right? You can set the mins and maximums just for a bit of extra control because this one here is just a, a you know, from one to minus one. So zero here means between the two values. So minus 180, 180, Right in the middle is zero. Um, if I set this to minus 360 and that one to 360, now the maximum will take us a whole rotation uh, in, in the positive value, and this will take uh, a rotation in the negative value. Now, this is good for overall control, but um, in this particular case, uh, if I'm doing some sort of modeling, it's good. But what if I want to have a, the same control over animation? Uh, let's say. So in that particular case, we're starting to talk about rail splines. So what are rail splines? Let me explain. Let's take this as our main deformation spline, and we are going to enter the domain of the spline wrap. I want to put some echo effects on my, uh, you know, and deepen it. Like, the spline wrap wrap. Okay, um, spline wrap. And what I'm going to do is, um, I'm not going to use the pyramid, but I am going to use a cylinder with three sides and 128 heights uh, because I want it to subdivide. Now, I'm going to tell the spline wrap, and uh, just for anyone that doesn't know, you see, look at this orange arrow. This is going to be the length by it will go on the spline. So I need to make sure this is pointing in the up direction, so that's uh, plus y. And now I can say, okay, apply this to the cylinder and put the spline in here, right? So now we have the same situation we had before. Of course, I can go to the rotation and do pretty much the same stuff I did over uh, at the, um, the sweep, right? So we have a lot of overlap. But what if I want to control the rotation, the sort of the spin of these using another spline? Other spline, other spline. Okay, um, let's do that. What I'm going to do is, to begin with, right, I'm going to take a copy of this spline. I'm going to name it Rail. Rail. Right. It's getting silly, I know. My echo effects. And I'm going to take the rail and just drag it up. I'm going to turn this little bugger off because it's annoying. I'm going to take my rail and lift it up. Okay? Now, imagine the following thing. Imagine, because these two splines are the same, imagine points pointing from the main spline at the same positions, right? If we connected these two, right? If we connected these two over here, those connection points uh, are, let's say, the rotation uh, directions. So if I tell the spline wrap to use a rail of the rail, now you will see that the x axis, that's what happens, the x axis of our arrow is trying to point to the, the rail. But now if I take the rail and start fiddling with it, I can control the spin by positioning a spline. So essentially how that works and how, um, how rotation is uh, calculated. Now, we all, I mean, we should know that a spline has the tangent. That's a direction, as I said before, which points to the point in front of it. If you want to see it, you make um, this cone you make it very, very thin, you tell it to align to spline, 
you drag your main spline in here. You set it to tangential. And now, as I'm moving the, the cone, the, where it, it, it's pointing, and I'm going to make it, I think it's a bit too pointy. There we go. Nice. Where the pointiness is pointing, that is the Z direction of the spline. That's all you need to remember. So it goes down, and it goes that way. So imagine if at any given point, that is the Z direction. There you go. You can see it's the Z direction. So if we use that Z direction as a pivot and move our X around, then literally we have a fixed point, which is a Z, and a direction pulling the X, just pulling it around to rotate this along the axes of that. That's what a rail, a rail spline does. So essentially, it's taking this sort of this object now is flowing over my spline and its X direction is trying to point to the rail spline. And this way we can have amazing control over what we are trying to do. And, um, oh, thanks, Basti, for answering questions. Uh, is that your, <laughs> is that your, your new occupation? Uh, you can become an intern on the Nose Man Nose channel and even come as a guest uh, one day. Let me put my camera on. So, uh, Basti wor works for Maxon. Um, uh, oh, I, if only I can tell you what he's working on. Um, he's working on some fantastic uh, projects, uh, spearheading. And um, just check on Basti's history, what he's dealt with uh, in the past. Uh, so because I can't say anything else. Anyway, he's doing a great job. Um, he is one of the most uh, knowledgeable Cinema 4D users I know, and uh, we're lucky to have him, you know, because he is um, very much embedded in the process of creating all the new tools you will see in the future. So thanks, Basti, for your work. I'll get my check later. So back to Mike. Okay, let's see any questions. Uh, tried Vamp. Uh, outrageous, uh, nice, yep. Good, thanks for the compliments. Um, do we do we do we do getting some time while I'm having dinner? <laughs> nice. So, um, this is what rail splines do uh, they just create the a position uh, in space where the x axis of, of an object that is used in whatever um, uh, different ways uh, can point, and I think that we have a rail spline over here as well. So let's uh, get rid of uh, this. Let's uh, take our cone and make it larger. Let's make the um, height segments one and the rotation segments uh, three. So now what we're going to see here is I'm going to use the same rail spline, but I'm going to use it in my align to spline. And there you go. You can see the X pointing upwards. So while this is sweeping over one spline, we're using uh, that extra rail spline to control the rotation. So if you want to have full control over exactly how something rotates uh, based on uh, spatial configuration, not rotations per se, but where you want it to, to point its x-axis, right? Uh, then um, you can use uh, rail splines, and uh, I find it a fantastic way to create uh, amazing effects. And um, uh, let's try one more thing, just for the fun of it. I may break it, but no one really cares. Uh, I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this and set this to uh, whatever. I'm going to uh, do that. Now, I'm going to make this. I'm going to leave it 200 and 200. I am going to use a spline wrap to wrap this along its Z axis. So spline wrap, Z axis, the arrow. Always remember where the arrow is pointing the Z axis, and I'm going to wrap, I'm going to spline wrap the helix on the main spline. And the reason why I'm doing that, it's because I want to wrap it around like a telephone cord or something in that matter. Now, I think that we can increase this or change the bias, yeah, to do also funky effects, right? Now, it's going to be maybe a bit too funky, but nonetheless, I've created a, a helix wrapped around another spline. And I could possibly take, put the cone down here and take this wrapped helix and use it as a rail path. And I don't even know what's going to happen. Yes, we are sort of, it's oscillating between those things. Now you would, of course, you would ask me, why isn't it rotating 
all the way around? That's a very good, that's a very good question. I do not know. Uh, but nonetheless, you can see an interesting thing happening. Maybe we're having gimbal lock or something like that. I would not know. And you can see that tangential, uh, the, the rail path only works with the tangential because the tangential is the one that guarantees one of the axes. And we need one more uh, to to create a proper rotation. If we don't have the, the fixed one, the first one, then it doesn't really make sense. Oh, axes, maybe it's the... No. Is it? No, 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 no. That's for the tangential part. Yep, that's for the tangential part. Sorry, I got carried away. Forgive me. So, uh, there we go. That's uh, one of the combinations you can use uh, to do that. So, let's see if we have any other... Um, questions uh, Twitter no Twitter no yeah uh, Sebastian is like um, uh, Basti is like Einstein uh, used to wear the same suit because he had many copies he doesn't do social media so he can focus on uh, the um, Maxon stuff right so don't don't forget that good let me look at my list now I'm gonna go show my face again big smile good uh, you can use this as a, a photo you can take selfies in front of your monitor when i'm on screen feel free to do that and uh, memes meme me up i don't care so i'm looking at my notes i use pencil and paper by the way i always say that um we showed the this uh, oh spline wrap i'm going to show you the spline deformer uh, because it's interesting for no other reason so this is a spline wrap, okay? Many people call it the spline uh, deformer, but uh, the, sp uh, the spline, it's a spline wrap. Now, the spline deformer itself, uh, the way I see it, is a fantastic piece of kit. When necessary, it can solve great problems because it allows you to deform meshes. So let's go and add quite a few subdivisions here, 100 and 100. Now, again, you may be able to do that using other methods, but... I like to to use the spline deformer. Now let's go and uh, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make something here and then I'm going to project it to show something that was asked before. So I've got a spline over here. There you go. Um, I've got a spline, and you can see that because I drew it in my 3D view. You may ask, where does it draw the spline? Where you in the 3D view? Well, it draws it on the camera plane right so i'm going to digress a bit to show you what that camera plane is let me delete the spline if you go here and you create a camera and you go here and let's bring the camera plane this is the camera plane i'm going to put the camera plane here and i'm going to go and draw a spline in the three view through this camera let's see what happens i'm very curious if it doesn't work I will give up. So let's go to the 3D view here, get out of the camera. What you will see is that that spline is drawn on a plane parallel to the camera plane. This is what we call the camera plane, the screen plane. You can see it's perfectly parallel. So whenever you're, you're modeling or you're making splines in your 3D view, imagine the glass in front of your monitor, the literal glass you've got in front of your monitor as your drafting paper. That's why you get that weird 3D thingamabooboo. So, uh, where was I? Okay, let's uh, let's go back and draw it again because I'm too lazy to, to place it. So, I'm going to draw a spline here and you can see that it falls within the object. Now, I'm going to use the project. So, in the, go through the spline menu and somewhere around here, it does have a uh, project uh, thingy. So, oh, uh, I can never find it. So, um... Where is the project? Doobie doobie. So I may even have gone through. There you go, project. And view mode, apply. That's it. So now it, it finds whatever mesh is within our view and puts the spline there. There you go. So now it's on the object. So if you painted something uh, and by you, you didn't paint it on here, you can do it using snapping, by the way. But if you do that, you just uh, use the project to project it on. Anyway. So, uh, what was I talking about? Yes, I was talking about the spline deformer, and sorry, I get carried away. And if I don't say something when I'm thinking about it, I'll probably forget it. So, get a, a uh, helix. I just love he helixes, and it's not heli, it's helixes. I'm going to get the height to be zero, and I'm going to make the end radius to be zero. So, I have this nice little spiral, okay? 
And you can do many things with Helix. You can even make straight segments. Now, if you use the the surface deformer, it has it 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 requires not the surface deformer, the spline deformer. <sighs> There you go, the spline deformer. The spline deformer needs two splines. The original spline, what it's going to use to sample the points it's going to uh, deform, and the destination, the modifying spline, which is what it's going to do with these points. So let's call this, um, I, I'm going to use the terminology, original and modifying. So helix original, and I'm going to make a copy of this and call it dest destiny. So the spline deformer takes all the points that lie on a radius of 30 centimeters from the actual spline, from the original spline, and uh, to see it better I always like to make these colored, and there you go, nice and green. And when you apply your destination in the object, it will move those points to the destination spline. So now the destination spline is what receives these points. So if I take this helix and move it, it's going to pull other points to those final positions. And what I like about the, the spline deformer is that it has a an explicit uh, condition as to which points are going to be moved by using the original spline and if you extend the radius you you grow this selection and if you, you can change the shape and do all sorts of other things and uh, this way you can select which of these uh, points are selected and uh, the modifying spline which can be a totally different one I don't even know how this is going to look but nonetheless it will let's go and make this uh, 360 and see what happens Hey, what a nice mess. But nonetheless, there you go. It's a beautiful mess you can play around with. Now, here's a nice little trick. Whenever you mess up your topology using procedural stuff, if you want to make it look fun, all you have to do is add a smoothing deformer. Because it will, the first thing it's going to do is try and untangle anything that's overlapping. So immediately you're getting something which is a bit more civil, right? Oh, that's um, some sort of volcano-ish thing, right? But nonetheless, you can see that you go from this terrible state to this. So the, the smoothing deformer would be a good way for you to untangle any possible um, things. Now, let's see what else we can do. Let me undo a few times and go back to that original state. And let me show you something else here, what else you can do. Let's uh, do a small effect. And um, let's use a, a, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do, I'm going to use a most spline with just um, one. So I'm going to create two most splines. Most spline uh, original, O, and most spline D, D. And uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell both most splines to be in spline mode. And I'm going to go to spline and say the original gets the orig and the destination gets the dest. Right. Good. And uh, what I'm going to do now is go to the spline and say, put the original in the original and put the destination in the destination, right? So it's pretty much what we had. But now I can take these two and say, I want to grow this. So now we're actually growing the deformation without using any fields or anything like that. So let's go to frame zero and add end 0%. Let's go to frame uh, 45. Um, let's go to frame 90 and uh, make it 100%. And let's extend this to 180 frames and go back to, I don't know, uh, frame 140 a bit faster and set it back to zero and do this. So now it's animating and it looks ugly, really ugly. And here is the power of deformers. Any deformation you create, or pretty much any deformation um, you create using a deformer, if you add a jiggle deformer, it will try and smooth it out. So look at this now. So now we took something which looks, which looks very rigid and odd and all that, and we've trans, translated it into something that looks a bit more organic and interesting. And again, the rule is add smoothing after all that. And now look at that. 
So now we're just using deformers, it's it's very controllable, it's art directable and so forth. And yet we're creating an interesting sort of wavy effect where you can create pseudo waves um, using text, using whatever you want, right? And again, this is just a very simple rig. You can recycle these, you can do whatever you want. And uh, what else? I mean, yeah, this is uh, what I wanted to, to show. Uh, destination, I can move it down a bit to change that. When you're using the jiggle, uh, just so that you know, um, there's one thing, the structural creates those secondary waves. If you want it to be just nice and smooth, um, it, take uh, get rid of the structural. The structural will create a lot of extra uh, jiggling. You may want it, but it adds um, a lot of that extra. It makes the whole thing be a bit more, uh, let's say, um, like, like fabric. It, it carries those, um, those jiggles further. Good. So let's see if we have any questions here. Um, Logan! So use the former. Thanks for showing it. Yes, I love all the formers. Okay, so uh, I'm going to try and collect my thoughts again by showing you me. Okay, so uh, Spline Wrap, any questions? Um, could this be used to look like a spoon mixing a liquid? Uh, just happen to need that currently. Yes, so uh, you could do, use this for, you know, the spoon, and you can sort of time the animation by using the same splines and the spoon and, and whatnot. Um, but the the collision deformer, uh, again, is a good solution to, to do that, where you just use it to push some of the geometry, and again, jiggle and smoothing to bring everything together. Um, I feel that with the splines, you may have a bit more uh, control, but no, it's 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 as usual. It's one of those things where there are about a thousand different ways to do it, and choosing the way has to do. Um, you know, it's up to you, up to your mood, and and so forth. And uh, Logan, yes, yes, we're not going to Greece this year, unfortunately, for a second year in a row. Hopefully, my ninety-six-year-old dad is going to make it until next year, and uh, yeah, he he will probably see my my son when my son is ready to join the armed forces in greece in greece we have mandatory uh, service hopefully by the time he's old enough uh, it's going to be two days they just go there say hi and they leave so yes logan will be in touch and um let me let me think uh so yes the answer would be that you could do it with a collision deformer the spoony thing you can do it with a splines and and uh, whatnot it's up to you. You can choose your way. Here's the Mac thingy. Okay. Um, spline wrap instead of sweep. All right. Let's see. Rail splines, animating, spline generators, and most spline. Connect. Tracer. Generates. Yep. So let's uh, continue a bit. What other hair generation? Uh, yes, the live, uh, everything will be recorded. Anything I do is in the public eye, unless for some reason I embarrass myself too much and I um, bury this um, in history. But I'm pretty sure someone else is recording it, so they'll just put it out there to embarrass me. Okay, um, how do we export DWG uh, from splines? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So, I don't uh, have one. I think uh, Sketch and Tune has some sort of a spline export. I think I did it. Something of things have changed, so I don't have a direct answer for that. Now, um, hopefully you can see. Yeah, you can see my Mac screen. Uh, other ways to generate uh, splines. Now, one thing maybe some people don't know, especially when you're using third-party renderers that don't support directly the Cinema 40s hair system, which most of them do, is you can make hair into splines. There are a couple of things you need to be aware of, uh, and uh, that is, let's go and create simulate, and let's make some uh, hair, right? So this is hair. Now, by definition, when you create hair, you create a lot of hair, so a lot of hair instances. And um, in the hair system, and the, the reason I'm talking about hair, I'm not going to go into too much of the weeds, because it, it, it is a two-hour um, live show on its own, um, and uh, you'd be surprised how well it holds um, compared to its age, right? It was uh, groundbreaking back in the time, and it still is very powerful. So, let's see. The, the hair system 
works on two levels. One is the guides. These are the blue little thingies you see here. And uh, the hair itself, you go to hairs over here, um, you will say it will create 50,000 strands of hair. These hairs are created by some sort of interpolation. It, 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 between two of these guides, it will create these things. So if I tell this to generate, it says render hairs here, if I tell it to generate splines, it is going to go and generate 50,000 splines. So let's make it 500. And let's go here and say generate splines. All right, so now splines, it's going to generate 5,000 splines, right? If you want to see what this is, you right click, you say current state object, and you'll see this is a set of splines with all these points here. And these points are the, the segments we have in the splines. And uh, there you go. So internally, it creates this uh, object. Now, if you want to create the same number of splines as the guides, then you need to go to hairs, roots, it's not very obvious, and in the roots you need to set not auto, which takes this, but as guides. This turns off, and now each one of our guides, each one of the blue lines becomes a spline. Right click, and uh, you say current state to object, you take this, you cut it, you paste it in new scene, and there you go, these are the guides. Now, since we've done this, what can we do with this? Well, because now these hairs are splines, um, most people, and this is something I've shown in some other of my um, my presentations for Maxwell and so forth, there is there is something which, if you want to do production ready uh, sort of tentacles hair and stuff like that with objects, a lot of people tend to take this and say, okay, I'm going to sweep this, right? I'm going to sweep this and um, get a circle or an insider just to make it a bit more economical, put the hair underneath and make this nice and small. And there you have it. We have all these nice little hairs. Uh, yes, but... Um, watch the segmentation here. As these bend, you can see the segments are moving around. And the, the count, the point count of these things changes, which means that if you're trying to use this with, uh, let's say, motion blur, uh, motion blur requires that you have a constant um, point count because it's based on the point positions to calculate the motion blur between one state in one frame of the geometry and another one. So what will be the alternative to this if you don't want to use this way? Well, here's the cool thing that I have to say I discovered, um, I discovered not so far back ago. Uh, the shape of what we're doing here, like the, the sweep, is a cylindrical shape, all right? And in this particular case, we can even use caps and so forth. I'm going to go with a cylinder. Now, I'm going to pull the cylinder out here so we can see it. And uh, I'm going to set this to 1 or 5 or something like that. Let's keep it big for the time being. Now, because I'm going to deform these along their height, although the rotation segments can be quite low, let's say 6 like the previous one, I want my height segments to be quite a few. So let's say 250 segments. I'm going to get rid of the caps for now, I don't have to. Let's let's leave it as it is. I don't really care. And what I'm going to do now, and this is the fun part, I'm actually going to take this cylinder that's very thin. I'm going to add a spline wrap. And one other thing the spline wrap does, which is not very obvious after I set it to plus Y, because I want it to, pay, to point upwards, is that I'm going to drop a bunch of splines in here. So let's do this. Before I do that, that's a surprise. That's the kicker. Let me go and create, uh, using the spline pen, I'm going to create, not the spline pen, nose man. Let's get the sketch. Do this, escape, do this. So we have a spline with two segments, right? If I put these two segments in here, you will see that we got two cylinders. So the way the spline wrap was designed was that depending on the... Um, the, the, the spline's number of, um, of segments of, um, I forget the word now, what is it called? Anyway, um, <clears throat> it will create another copy of the object we are spline wrapping. So instead of the spline, if I take and drag the hair in here, we should get cylinders. I'm going to make it a bit thicker. Look at that. We're getting cylinders for each hair 
and they deform. Now, the great thing about using a spline map is because it deforms existing topology, it's not generating like the spline, uh, the, the sweep generator takes two splines and uses parameters from the two splines to generate a mesh. With a spline wrap, it's actually using the absolute number of points per cylinder. So regardless of um, of how the splines are moving and how everything is what's going on here, every single cylinder has exactly at every frame the same amount of points, which means that this can be rendered using uh, motion blur uh, very effectively and without um, any flipping, uh, any, uh, let's say, weird uh, point changes that create those very um, bad artifacts between frames. So that is uh, one of those things which I believe is very important relating to splines. If you're going to use a bunch of splines to create... Um, you know, sweeps up to this point, I would suggest you start using, you start using uh, spline wraps because I haven't seen if it's more efficient, but this works nicely and provides you a production ready um, situation where the point counts are steady. And of course you can go and, and change things like make them pointy. So this is great for doing all sorts of, uh, you know, cartoon hair or something like that, or weird fishy fishies and, you know, starfish and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, let's see. Can I draw? Yep, right on. Oh, no, no questions. Has everyone fallen asleep? Hello? Okay. <clears throat> now, let's see if we have any... Um, any good questions and yeah go, go go and check out my 3d motion show um the thing i did f with the um, jellyfish i i did something with um i did something with uh, jellyfish and tentacles and all that which actually had hair um just like this one and the, the good thing is that you can use hair dynamics to sort of control um control how these are going to interact uh, between you know each of these tentacles how they're going to interact with the sphere itself so in this particular in this particular case you can always go to the hair it's going to slow things down of course go to to dynamics or forces um, you can go to the sphere and you can add from the simulation a cloth collider it's not a cloth it's hair collider yeah excuse me i was just about to say uh a nasty word so um hair collider so now the sphere itself uh, doesn't allow penetration uh, you can go to the hair dynamics itself and um, you can have um, hair to hair dynamics if you wish to to do that just go go through uh, the the various um, parameters here and again right click go to the help and find out so hair to hair will allow you to uh, create some sort of um uh, collision field the cylinder is four centimeters you can go here and say okay i want a radius of five centimeters so now um it's going slower but you are getting proper uh, dynamics between um uh, between these hairs so if i take my sphere and start uh, rotating it you will see that we're getting a quite a good uh, quite good interaction. One thing you need to remember when you're doing um, dynamics, hair dynamics, is one of the most important parameters, most important is the segmentation. Because the collisions are calculated on the point level, not on a spline level. So if you have a big um, space between two points, um, two segments of the spline, uh, they will go through each other. So yeah, let's go 64, and uh, if we crash, I'm going to switch to the pc it, it is going slower you know save as a lambic and all that but with let's go 32 or 16 right i think i was getting a bit ahead of myself 16 not bad and mind you this is a mac pro from 2010 so it's 11 years old it's it's past i bought it in april, april uh, 2010 so it's 11 plus years old and um still it, it holds quite well um on the on the pc it's much more uh, performance so yeah anyhow try and use a spline wrap with uh, hair and so forth uh, watch those uh, shows and um, you know try to figure out how it works it's very very simple just drag your hair here or whatever else you want 
and uh, you can create some very stable animation that uh, works with um, motion blur, uh, especially if you're using Redshift and all that. And it, the, the results are beautiful and um, very controllable, right? Because we all want to do, you know, we want to do production ready scenes. Okay, um, Harope. Okay, so let me uh, see if there's another question here. Doobie, 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 doobie. Let me uh, grab one of my uh, nicotine sweets. I don't smoke anymore, but I'm still addicted. So don't do that. <clears throat> don't try any um, any weird chemicals, guys. They're all addicted. Uh, addicted. Okay, so uh, let's check out the, um, the whole rope. Now, there was a question about uh, rope creation. Let me go to my PC and uh, switch. Boop. You should be able to see my PC now. And this is one of the re results, all right? Now, don't get overtly excited. This is, um, this is uh, uh, a, an Alembic. I, I sort of baked this out on Alembic. Now, the whole rope um, itself, the principle behind it, and I haven't got it here. No, I don't have it here. I have it on my Mac. So let's go back to the Mac. Boop. And let me show you how, how it works. It's... Um, it's a utility plugin, all right? And there's a question, how can we weld two points of a spline? All right, since that is a simple question, all right? So uh, if you want to weld, so first of all, do you want to join these in the same position? Then undo what I do, right click. Um, you need to weld these either in the middle or on each and every one of these points. So now they're welded. Or you say uh, join segment. Uh, sorry, not join segment. You just close your spline, right? Cinema 4D has a state for closed spline. So if I do this, it will carry the tangents. But if you want to weld them, you just use the, the weld tool, which exists both for the mesh and the spline tool. So right click with your point selected and you go weld and you weld them. Now, this is still open, so you can close it. Now, the, as you can see, there's a bit of a problem here because it creates two points. So I think that you join the segment and... Oh, interesting. Why doesn't it join the segments? I would expect it to join the segments. Okay, let's go again. Join. It didn't join. Okay, close. Join segments. All right, now um, my brain is a bit fried. Why can't I weld these two buggers? Oh, there you go. I need to use the weld. Duh. Okay, anyhow. Don't ask me hard questions. So where were we? Um, I totally lost my train of thought. Knots, right. Now, the whole rope um, just creates an internal uh, structure. Uh, so let's get a, let's sketch a spline. All right, let's, let's create this, right. Get this spline. I'm going to make sure the points are avoiding each other. And there you go. Oops, that was a bit wrong. And, uh, well, we can use the resampling now. So I drew the spline. Let's let's try that. I drew the spline. I'm going to go to most spline. Set this to a spline. I think I can resample them anyway, but I'm going to do it using this method. And I'm going to drag the source spline in here. And I'm going to set my um, points, let's say, to even and, uh, let's say, 16. All right? All right. So... What you can see here is all these uh, simple segments. What I would do, uh, you could make this editable, and you can go and tell it to be a uh, B-spline, right? Or you can tell it to be um, a Bezier. So with one con extra conversion, you can go and set these points to be equidistant and so forth, and it doesn't take that long. Another thing you need to remember is that we have the, um, the spline smooth, right? The spline smooth has uh, smooth, flat, and random, pull, spiral, inflate. It has all these. It's for sculpting for sculpting splines. So go check it out. Um, I'm not going to show it right here and right now for the time being. So let's go and just distant these because if you're making ropes and strings and so forth, you don't want the actual rope to overlap with itself. You you want it to be sort of out of the place. But let's take this for example. Now what does a whole rope do? Her rope, you, it's a generator. And when you do this, uh, you'll be like, oh, this looks cool. Uh, press play, nothing happens. It just generates the the following thing for you. I'm going to show you. So how many bones do you want it to have? Let me set this here. 
So it creates these sort of bones, as he calls it, and what the radius of your rope is going to be or whatnot, um, if you can have segments, caps and all that. Um, you can even create a sweep object. All right. Now, you can't use it as it is. There's no way to use it. What you're supposed to do with her rope is once you've done this, you make it editable. And watch what it does internally. It just sets up things for you. It keeps the original spline. It creates a sweep using a tracer. And the tracer itself is based on some capsules that have a dynamic tag. So what happens now, it even creates two control nulls for you. The controls, the root. It has the root. Let me go and extend this to, let's say, 10,000 frames so we can play around with it a bit. And the target. So the whole rope itself doesn't do any dynamics by itself, but it converts your spline. Look at how fun that is. It converts your spline into a setup where it uses Cinema 4D's connectors. Yeah, just imagine if you have to go and create all these connectors. And it creates the 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 root and the target, uh, which are basically holding together the first connector and the last connector. And uh, yeah, uh, there you go, the first connector and the last connector. And it adds these uh, beautiful little um, rigid body tags. So let's go and do a knot, an actual knot. So first of all, you need to create a knot. There's a fantastic tutorial if you just search on YouTube that shows the whole process. I'm just going to go very quickly through it. Um, you can scan a knot or something like that. But as far as I know, a knot is this. I'm actually going to do this, 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 and this. So this is a knot, right? This is a basic knot. The only thing I need to do here is make sure that we have one side going, uh, this comes in above, this goes out the bottom, right? So that goes out the bottom. Then this, at a point, goes on top. I want it to cross over here on top, right? So that's how it goes on top. And this goes to the bottom. So this is a basic knot. So this starts over. There you go. This starts over. Goes under. Good. And let's just put it under her rope and see what that does. So her rope. And reminds me of uh, the Australian equivalent of toodaloo, which is huru, and uh, there we go. And now you can see that when we pull these two, it is going to be a knot. I can always go and sort of adjust this a bit, or make it thinner. Anyhow, if I press play now, nothing will happen because I need to make it editable, make sure all your parameters are. What people like to do is just um, don't can't state to object. It gives you a slightly different result. Make a copy, press C. That's what you need to do, right? And just make this invisible and all that nice stuff. So now look at this. We have a knot. That's how you make a knot. You need to draw the knot with your splines, whatever you're trying to do. And then you use the um, these two these two connectors. Sorry, connectors, the controls root and target to create whatever animation you want to do. So you can do um, a, a proper knot or you can animate these connectors to go through and do some sort of um, other loop and so forth. Now, one thing I found interesting is that you can go and change some of the parameters to make it uh, sort of um, work a bit better. So let's uh, do this and I would go and set in the main rigid body tag um, I would go and set in the collision the bounce to um, nothing or something very small, the friction to 200%. Because a rope sort of uh, is a bit, you know, it, it's not very slippery unless you're doing some sort of tubing and stuff like that. And um, one of the tricks I did, let me go and open. So let's go to the PC for a second and um, watch this animation. And you will, what I would like you to see here, and I'm going to go and find a version of this, right? Let this play. I'm going to find it on the, on the Mac that has um, everything I need. So procedural. 
I'm opening on a file on the Mac here, and I'm going to show you then a trick on how to create. So back to my Mac, and I want to show you a trick of how to create sort of an intersect where, where these two intersect. You can see it becomes thinner. There, there's sort of avoidance here. This is the based on a technique um, I created. Uh, in my cell packing tutorial. If you go on my YouTube channel, you'll find there's something about cell packing where I'm using a, a volume to sort of um, make uh, spheres or cells or something uh, avoid overlap to a certain degree. I'm using the same technique here, and it makes it seem that this is tightening up, as you can see there. And just, I mean, this is not splines per se. Um, I can share this file. If anyone wants it, let me know and I'll share it with you. So basically, I have my whole rope here that does all that nice stuff over here. So, and uh, this is um, the actual unsquishy rope, the one I created. The, the spline wrap I'm using, not, I'm not using the sweep that the whole rope uh, generates. I'm using the, the spline wrap. And uh, what I'm doing, I made a copy of this cylinder exactly the same and I put it under a volume object just so that I have I'm, I'm driving both spline wraps uh, with the same uh, the, the same tracer as far as I remember which is the the whole rope dynamics following all the connectors and so forth that's how it works you can dissect it and find out and um, in the volume object I'm using a fog volume and uh, basically I'm creating a fog volume where the surface that's how fog works the surface is zero and down in the depths if I'm using maximum voxel fall off, is one, which means that any part of this little guy, and if I turn these on, any part of this little guy, I've got the volume in here, that falls within the inside, that happens to be inside, that's the trick here. You can see that when two meshes overlap, their polygons are inside the other mesh. And because they're inside the other mesh, here they are, they're inside the other mesh, because they're inside, they happen to live in parts of the volume where the value is higher than zero. And I'm using that in the plane effector to just push these polygons out and then a smoothing to smooth them out. If you watch that uh, tutorial I made about the cell packing, you realize. So there are quite a few tricks you can do by combining volumes and still keep it fairly uh, procedural. Yeah, um, for the file, please, uh, what do I need to do? I'm going to, right after the show, I'm going to post a, a tweet, and I need to take a note. Uh, tweet about anyone wanting a file. So tweet about project files. I'm going to tweet, and anyone that wants it, I may even put some sort of Dropbox there that contains some of these things, and let me know. So, uh, but anyhow, this is, uh, I can provide you with the whole uh, file, and um, just because we're here, just uh, because we're here, uh, if you go to the whole rope, so let me, I just want to make sure I have too many, much stuff open in my computer. So I think the best thing to do is put my camera on. Hello, everyone. And um, I'm going to go and open up the actual code of the whole rope so I can show you what you, you can do. Let me just open it um, one second. So um, I'm opening it. I deal with too many things. I just want to make sure that uh, nothing's going to go open. I'm opening a file, mind you, one second. So I need to go. Where do I need to go? I need to go. Oh, my God. I forgot where I want to go. All right. Noseman shows. Um, but ba dooby 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 dooby. This is the way I think. I have to say dooby dooby dooby. So ho rope. R23, is that the one? Where is the other one? Is that the one? I think that's the one. Okay, so let me share my Mac screen again. And again, sorry for that. I, I deal with a lot of things and uh, my, my position, um, you know, uh, I, I don't want to show something on screen that shouldn't be. So this is the, the code of the show, uh, the whole rope plugin. You can open it in any text editor. And uh, the problem with when this was written was the X range. So go to this is Sublime Text, but you can do this in text edit or any text editor. You will find 
X range. You find X range and find whatever X range. Now, this doesn't exist because I changed it. And this is the word you're looking for, X range, one word, and you will change it to range. There you go. So for I in X range was the, um, the way this, this was written in previous uh, Python versions. And we just change every single occurrence of X range to range. You save that as it is, as a uh, herope.pyp file, and that is ready for you to work. And that runs in all versions that have incorporated. And it, it may even work in previous versions. I'm not quite sure. Everyone thinks I know Python. I know enough to make you think that I know Python. That's what I would say. So get the Hero plugin so you can prepare these things. Um, the scene itself doesn't have the plugin anymore because I converted it. I, I pressed the C and made it editable. But go ahead, check some tutorials and, and so forth. Okay, let's see if we have any questions here. For a moment, I thought my camera was still on. And I thought, oh, no, no, again. Orestes, there you go. Uh, yes, Orestes, which is in the chat, is going to be one of my um, my guests um, over the next uh, couple of months. So prepare prepare any questions you have. Right, uh, I would say prepare the hard questions for Orestes. Yeah, that's what you need to do as hard as possible. Uh, he will find a solution for you. And the, the more you, um, you you prepare the the questions, uh, the more the earlier you you post them, the better it is for everyone. Okay, where was I now? Um, let's do, wh where are we? So in 15 minutes, we're sort of close to two hours. And I think I'll cap it to that. Um, let's see if we have any um, questions. So x ray changed to, uh, with R23. Uh, when the x range thing, and this is for, for Kent, um, the X range became range when Python 2.7 became Python 3. It may have been S22 or R23 or something like that. But anyhow, that's what you need to do. We'll try my best. All right. Um, Orestes is, um, you know, he, he's a, a very humble guy. And if I had his knowledge, I would probably wouldn't talk to anyone. That's what I would say. So, um but, uh, some particles. So what I'm going to do now, I am going to do some particle spline things. Uh, very rudimentary. I'm going to use a tracer and, and so forth. Oh, before that, I'm not going to do particles. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show you how to create... Okay. I'm going to show you how to create uh, a toothpaste tube. Now, you would ask me, why toothpaste tube? What's, what's unique about toothpaste tube? Well... Here's what's unique about toothpaste tube. All right, so let me explain this while I'm opening some files on my Mac. Usually, when you have some graphics uh, with um, sort of toothpaste and all that, so how does a toothpaste tube work? It's a cylinder. It's actually a cylinder. Uh, so when, when they haven't capped the, the backside of it, it's a normal cylinder. And then they, they sort of they heat uh, shrink or sh heat weld the top. And it becomes sort of that trapezium shaped. But the diameter of the actual cylinder, the, the circumference of that doesn't change. So if you want to design a, a proper uh, toothpaste uh, thingy, you need to make sure that at every level while that's fanning out, the circumference of that circle is always the same. And this poses a very, very specific uh, sort of problem. So let me find, I'm looking on my Mac now, I'm going to find, going to find the tube with lengths. All right, so I'm going to show you this. Right. You, you may be a bit uh, spooked by what you see. So this is a proper tube. And the reason it's proper is that I'm using a very simple expresso. I'm going to show you how to, how to put this together. I mean, we're using a very simple expresso to see at every single level of every single spline what the circumference is. And I'm using the ellipse mode uh, for the circle uh, spline, where if you click ellipse, it gives you the, the radius for the uh, x and the, the y. 
And basically, if I want to make, for example, the second one, this one over here, as long as the number matches with the first one, which is a perfect circle, the per first one, uh, let's make it um, 150 and 150, right? So this should be a perfect circle. That's how the tip of the the tube is. And you can see that the circumference is uh, 942. As long as we stay around this number when we measure the circumference of each and every one of these, um, that means that we are retaining the physical properties of a proper tube. So all we have to do is say, um, I'm going to take my client's sort of front-facing view. They're going to show you a view of the, usually what happens, the, the agencies. They take a photo of the product, and you just snap that, and you use it as your reference to, to drive your horizontal. So let's say that at this point, this is how, how thick it is, right? But now you can see the circumference is higher than this. Take the other dimension, because the wider the tube becomes, the shorter it becomes, because tubes do not change circumference, right? It's rigid, it, it's plastic, it, it bends, but the more you press it, the more it stretches. So you go down, 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 until you get approximately to 942, or 944, it doesn't really make a difference. No one can tell the difference. Then go to the third one. Maybe I want this to be a bit wider, so make it thinner. So let's go, oh, we've reached the, the limit. So if you take a tube and you squish it down to a flat thing, it can't become uh, flatter than flat. So we've exceeded uh, the, the, the range it can actually uh, reach. So uh, this is pretty much zero. You need to find out what's the minimum thickness. So uh, 941 over here. And I think we need to do the same thing for this. It cannot be more than uh, a certain width, because then our tube is very, very, very squished, right? And uh, we, we cannot stretch it more than the actual circumference. But what you see here, funny enough, um, this would be the way a tube would actually look if we compress it to this level. Now, usually, this is an empty tube, right? A, a, a more fuller tube would be thicker, in the y direction, yeah, in the y direction, and a bit narrower. Now, that th that is the number one. Let me show you how to do that. A very simple espresso, extremely simple espresso. And uh, then I'm going to show you the second issue with uh, with UVing. Right, there, there is an issue with UVing when you're using uh, a loft, because we are using a loft with these splines. And uh, I'm going to show you what the problem is. So let's go to a new document and let's create a circle, get an ellipse, right? I'm going to use this one as it is. Now, let's go and create um, a programming espresso tag. And I know I'm going to lose a lot of people with the espresso, but whatever. Grab this here, put the circle in here. I'm going to call it circle one, so I know exactly what I'm doing. Now, in order to read the spline parameters, because this is a generic uh, operator, it's an object operator, it doesn't give you access to any of the specifics other than the parameters, right? This is what you will get as an input and output. The basic, the coordinates, the object, and that's it. You need a spline node. And the spline node, you feed it an object, which is basically the object we're getting here, right? You can always sort of link an object, but this is the best way to do it. And amongst the other things, it gives you the length of the spline. Now, let me take um, a text spline. I'm going to take a text spline. Make it a child, because I want it to follow around. There you go. I have a text spline. And I'm just going to lay it on the floor so I can see it from a certain angle. And what you do with a text spline is you, you drag it in here, and then if you want to find which parameter is this text, you just take this and drag it on the left. So now I can drive the length and put it in the text plane. So now, at any given moment, when I change the x and y, I know what the circumference of this circle is. So if I wanted to apply the same thing to everything else, um, I can just go and make a copy of this, drag it up here, and take this and change it. And you can see we change the numbers. As long as the numbers are close to each other, so 1258, these two ellipses, the circle and this ellipse, are actually, um, they, they react just like a, a proper tube would react. And then you can take this one and make another copy, 
and uh, let's go and uh, make this one a bit thicker and a bit thinner as long as we keep things close to 250 260 or something like that again the the, the differences are so small but visible and then you make a fourth one move it up here squish it down nicely that way is the squishy and just make sure that it's 12 something there you go so these profiles here represent how a tube would look so i can always take these little guys uh, here and put them in a loft now here's the problem with this let's go uh, let's take away the splines out of here let's assume that we're done with the splines we've we've created all the proper lengths because if i put these directly into a loft object let's go loft over here drag all these and put them in the loft um and uh, one of the, the the obvious problem with the uvs is that the way the interpolation is going to happen this polygon and this polygon are not equal this means that if i go and apply my graphic to this what will happen is i'm going to get uh, squishy uh, little bits over here so again um, i'm going to go and load um, a tube i've already made here which i need to find in another folder and tube 3d project got it and uh, loft correct there we go and let me load the incorrect one one second here we go all right so let me switch back to the mac and again i apologize for this but i need to make sure so this is a slightly different thing where i've, I've created an extrusion i just want to show you what the problem is going to be and i've created an extrusion this is my artwork it's flat artwork which represents a proper tube uh, situation if i take the ffd and start stretching this because of that discrepancy between the side points being narrower look at how wide these are and look at how um sorry how wide these are and how narrow these are we are going to get a squishiness we need to make sure that at every given point when this starts deforming that we will have the equal size of these polygons going all the way around and the correct one which is done using that method will give you this result you can see that other than the very edge ones and that's because of the subdivision right but in in essence all these polygons are precisely the same length and in order to achieve that we have to do something like this let me go to my entitled 14 and convert this so that we can make all these polygons look exactly the same now i'm going to go for with three of these because i'm too lazy i'm going to do it with four whatever we're going to th this is the last thing i'm going to show for today so i'm going to go and get a most spline. so i'm going to take these guys out and uh, i'm going to take a most spline. i'm going to name it most spline one i'm going to set it to spline mode in the spline i'm going to drag circle one and i'm going to go to my count and let's set this to let's say eight I might impress something else. There you go, eight. So we have these eight points. Now I'm going to go and make a most spline two, not three, two, and put this one here. Make a most spline three, and put this one here, and make a most spline four, and put this one here. Good. So now we have what's happening here. Look at these. Seg the segmentation because i'm defining a specific number regardless of how i compress this these are always the same that wouldn't be the case look at look at the source spline how when we compress our ellipse how this and this change ratio whereas if we resample it with a specific number of points then we are forcing the most spline object to create these based on that number and now we put these under the loft but there's one thing we need to remember is that we need to use organic form that is what's going to create the the correct number of points if you it's called organic form but if you go to the help it will just tell you that all the points are going to pass through each of the the points of the the source but anyhow um now 
if you do get a split of the points, because the most blinds are never closed, most blinds are always open. So on top of this, you would add a connect object. I always forget where it is. So connect object. Make sure welding is on. Put this under the connect object. So now it's going to weld these. Make sure that your fung and all that is correct. And you can always put this under a subdivision surface. It's going to introduce a very small amount of uh, distortion here because it has to fold this around. The way to remedy this is just to increase the number of subdivisions. And I think that the best idea is to have, so if we have eight, let's make this 16 and see what happens. 16 here and loft 16 or 17. Mm, that is something I need to revisit. The more uh, segments you have, the, the more accuracy you're going to have. Uh, oh, no, because now we have increases. So no, make it eight. So let's go eight and let's go here. We can use the same uh, number there, but eight will do as well. And uh, this will make, is it nine? See, now I'm, there you go, it's nine. It's number of points plus one. And this is the, the correct tube. And you have all your numbers here that you can check to see if your circumferences are the same. And uh, overall, by Reusing splines again. This is one of the files um, I'm going to share with you, so you can go and check it out. But the the key things you need to remember is that the loft needs to be um, organic form. Will will give you the uh, let's say the the proper way. The the uh, it will minimize that uh, distortion as much as possible. You can see that happening here. All right. So look at this. It's much smaller, bigger, 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 bigger. Whereas if you put organic form, it does fold around, but it tries to keep as many of these equidistant, which means you won't have a distortion. And love tube correct. This is the example over here. So let's subdivide this and uh, let's uh, put it on over here. This would be a physically accurate way to create a tube based on a proper this is, I made this by the way, so it's not even good, but this is it. It's, you know, it's properly placed. It's cut right in the middle. It, it, it's a parallel. That's how you would get your artwork for something like this. And yet it places this here without um, distortion. The only distortion is the, the natural distortion you would get from your, um, uh, from, you know, be, sort of pressing this in. And that's the same distortion you would get. Um, if you were making this in reality. And of course, on top of that, you can go and add your bend deformers or make this nice and squishy. You can make a spline at, on the side view. Let's go and do that before I close. There's always one more thing, isn't there? So go do this and do that and do that. And um, go here and add a spline wrap. Badoom, badoom, spline wrap. And uh, you want it across the Y. There you go, arrow always that way. Put the spline in here and make sure you re keep the length. And see, it spun around. Um, that's not a problem. You can always go to rotation and bank it. So to, to sort of bring it um, around 90 degrees or make it minus Y if you want to do it this way. Noseman shows. And of course, you can go and do your own little animation thingies and, um, you know, animate a cartoon uh, little um, toothpaste thingy. Okay, so uh, yes, this is pretty much the end. Let me go to my camera. If there are any uh, quick uh, questions, um, if we have any quick questions, otherwise we are going to wrap it up. Please share the love, um, share the links, um, you know, follow, ask, interact, subscribe, ring bells, uh, I don't know what else I can say, you know, just do what uh, everyone needs to do. And uh, thank you very much for, for being part of this. And uh, hopefully you learned at least one thing today. And it says, I wish Sinof Audi had better sub D modeling tools. Any chance for updating them anytime soon? You know I can't reply to those questions. Um, <laughs> Athanosius, nice one. So, uh, Basti, thanks for hanging out and uh, interacting. Speak to you soon. So in um, the next 30 seconds, I'm going to put the 
end credits, which is pretty much the other music. And if you if you like that little dance music, maybe I'll I'll create a, a little album so you can just listen to the same song again and again and again and again and again until you you know you get very angry. That will be a good thing. Yeah. So interact on Twitter, follow, share, and watch the videos a few times. Thank you very much for participating. Uh, I really enjoyed doing that. And uh, look out for announcements. Um, look out for the guests we're going to have and um, some other videos I'm preparing. And I think the next one is going to be UVs for the people that think they're infuriating. We'll see what we'll do. Take care. Thank you everyone for coming.